webinar with the California field team of Defenders of Wildlife. So as folks are coming in, you can open up the chat and see where everybody's joining from. Um, and my name is Monica. I am our California program coordinator. And I'm going to start today with a land acknowledgement. So our Defenders of Wildlife team acknowledges that we live and work on the ancestral and unceded land of dozens of indigenous tribes who have lived here since time immemorial. We are grateful for their continued leadership and stewardship of our shared natural resources and wildlife. Our team is committed to working in partnership with tribal governments and indigenous-led organizations to advance our shared goals of wildlife conservation and coexistence. So today we're gonna to be hearing from California Pro Program Director Pamela Flick and our Water Policy Advisor, Rachel Zwillinger. And before I hand it over to them, I'm gonna go over a couple of Zoom best practices for today. Please remain muted throughout the entire session. If you come off mute, I will remute you, and it's nothing personal, but it helps us to prevent background noise. So rather than unmuting yourself, you can send any questions or comments that come up throughout the webinar in the chat, right where everybody was just sending their locations. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Pamela Flick to give us an introduction of Defenders of Wildlife and our California program. Great, thank you so much, Monica, and thank you all for taking time to join us today to learn more about California's wetlands. We have a very informative presentation from Rachel that I'm sure you will enjoy. As members and supporters of Defenders, you're likely aware that Defenders is dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. We were founded in 1947 as Defenders of Fur Bearers, but since then have expanded our work to include critters with wings and scales and feathers, and of course we still work on fur bearers across the country. Some of these species are shown here. Defenders envisions diverse wildlife populations in North America that are secure and thriving, sustained by a network of healthy lands and waters. And this vision drives our work every day. As depicted on this map, Defenders works in nearly all corners of the United States, from our headquarters in Washington, DC, to field offices in Alaska, to the Southeast, to the Pacific Northwest, to the Desert Southwest, the Rockies and the Plains, and right here in the Golden State. We also have a long-term contractor who does work for us down in Mexico. Here in California, we do a great variety of work within diverse landscapes that we call focal landscapes and key issues affecting species and habitat conservation, including renewable energy, land use planning, water and wetlands, and state legislation. Um, you might be able to make out the small thumbtacks which show where our staff are located across the state. And I'll just note that the two purple blotches in Northeastern California are areas of known wolf activity. As you likely know, um, California is one of the newest homes to uh, gray wolves as they continue to expand their into their historical range. And then the blue line along the central coast of our state is the current uh, range of Southern sea otters or California sea otters. Next slide. And here are just a few of the landscapes where we work from the iconic Joshua trees of the, of the uh, Mojave Desert to the high elevation ecosystems of the expansive Sierra Nevada along the Pacific coast and to the wetlands of our great Central Valley, which will be discussed in greater detail today. Next slide. And Defenders California uh, program staff pictured here is small but mighty um, with six members working throughout the state. And we also have a number of expert contractors on our team who work on legislative um, advocacy and state budget issues, energy and land use planning and water policy. And without further ado, let's get on with the show. So over to you, Rachel. Um, I was just saying, thanks so much for joining today. It's really exciting to see so much interest in wetlands. Um, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking generally about wetlands and why they're so important. Talk a little bit about trends over time um, and then spend a little time discussing some of the threats that California's wetlands are facing today and some of the things that Defenders is working on to try to protect our last remaining wetlands. Uh, but to get us started, what is a wetland? So the technical definition of a wetland is complicated and controversial, mostly because of how that wetland is used in various regulatory processes. 
But basically, a wetland is an area of land that is covered or saturated with water for all or a part of the year. And there are many different kinds of wetlands. There are bogs, swamps, marshes, fens, um, vernal pools, and many others. In California, most of our wetlands are marshes, but we have a lot of other types. Um, one of my personal favorites are vernal pools, which are seasonal, seasonal depressional wetlands um, that fill up with water from rain in the winter and then dry out as we enter the summer months. Um, and you can find them in the Central Valley and in Southern California and elsewhere. And they're, they're particularly neat because there are species that have adapted to live only in this type of wetlands where they've adapted to live in the seasonal um, wetting and drying cycle and they don't exist anywhere else on earth. Um, and that brings me to, next slide, one of the reasons why um, wetlands are so important to defenders of wildlife and generally is because they're really essential for wildlife. Um, according to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, one third of threatened and endangered species across the country live exclusively in wetlands, and almost half of listed species depends on, depend on wetlands for at least a part of their life cycle. Um, in California, wetlands are particularly important for resident and migratory birds, for juvenile Chinook salmon, reptiles like giant garter snakes and western pond turtles, and so many other species. I often think about our wetlands as the nursery grounds for much of the state's wildlife. Next slide. Um, California wetlands are also globally important for wildlife. California is situated along the Pacific Flyway, which is a roughly 10,000 mile bird corridor that spans from the tip of South America up to the Arctic. And wetlands in California are an important stopover point along this migratory pathway where birds stop to rest and refuel along their journey. And wetlands in California's Central Valley are particularly important for the flyway. Um, they're the most important stopping point for 5 million migratory waterfowl, um, which is 60% of the Pacific Flyway waterfowl population and 20% of the continental waterfowl population. And you'll see throughout this presentation, I will focus a lot on Central Valley wetlands. And part of the reason why is because of the really important role that they play for the Pacific Flyway. Next slide. But wetlands are important for much more than wildlife. They're also really essential for water supply and water quality. Um, with respect to water supply, wetlands are wonderful for replenishing underground aquifers. They're a place in the landscape where water pools and can often percolate into um, the groundwater table. And as California grapples with more frequent and severe droughts, the state is looking for more opportunities to store water so that we can capture years, water in wet years and use it in dry years. And rather than damming rivers, which have had horrible ecological consequences over time, um, we've been focused on looking at expanding our underground storage opportunities. And to do that, wetlands provide a, a great opportunity to use natural infrastructure to recharge our groundwater tables. Wetlands are also great for improving water quality. As water flows through a wetland, um, much of the sediment is able to be captured and filtered out along with toxins and contaminants. And the water that flows out of a wetland is much cleaner than the water that flowed into it. Wetlands also provide flood protection and coastal resilience. Um, with respect to flood protection, wetlands are wonderful at helping water to spread out and slow down across the landscape. And what you're looking at in this image on the left is a picture of the Yolo Bypass near Sacramento. And it's an example of a really successful natural infrastructure project that uses wetlands to protect communities and urban infrastructure. Um, and using wetlands for flood protection is one of these wonderful win-win opportunities where we can invest in protecting and expanding wetlands 
in a way that provides habitat for wildlife and that also protects communities and urban infrastructure. Um, wetlands are also really important for coastal resilience. They provide a buffer against storm surges and wave activity. And as we are seeing sea levels rise with climate change, I think coastal wetlands are going to become um, increasingly important for resilience of coastal communities and coastal ecosystems. And finally, wetlands are great for recreation and outdoor access. Um, our wetlands provide opportunities for bird watching, hiking, photography, hunting, and make wonderful outdoor classrooms where kids can get out and get their feet wet and learn about natural processes and wildlife. Um, Defenders has been really focused on thinking about recreational opportunities um, and access to nature and the role that wetlands can play, particularly in California's San Joaquin Valley. Um, as you see in this map, um, the green colors indicate public lands, both state and federal public lands. The orange are also public lands. They're particular um, wildlife, wetland wildlife refuges in the Central Valley that I'll talk a lot more about in the, in the coming slides. And then in purple, you see what have been designated as disadvantaged communities, according to the California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and what I see in looking at this map is that for communities, and particularly disadvantaged communities, living in the valley floor um, in the San Joaquin Valley, most of the public lands are up in the Sierras or in the coastal range and are not particularly easy to access. But these wetland wildlife refuges in the San Joaquin Valley provide really excellent opportunities for near to home access to nature. Um, so we're doing a lot of thinking about how particularly in light of the state and federal initiatives um, that are just rolling out to try to conserve 30% um, of our lands and waters by the year 2030, the role that wetlands and California's Central Valley could play in expanding access to nature opportunities for disadvantaged communities. Unfortunately, um, in spite of all of their, the important roles that they play for wildlife, water supply, water quality, et cetera, um, wetland losses across the United States have been profound. Um, across the continental U.S., we lost 53% of wetlands between the 1780s and the 1980s, and those losses have continued since then. California has lost more of its wetlands than any other state. Statewide, less than 10% of the state's historical wetlands remain, and the Central Valley's wetland loss has been even more profound. Um, and the, the latest estimates I've seen are that only about 5% of our historical wetlands remain. Um, and, you know, thinking about Central Valley wetlands, there are some species that exist only in Central Valley wetlands, like giant garter snakes, for example, which once had access to wetland habitats throughout the, the, the San Joaquin and Sacramento Valley. And as those wetlands habitats have shrunk, so have the populations, and that snake is now listed under the Endangered Species Act um, and is pretty imperiled. So recognizing the importance of wetlands in the Central Valley to the Pacific Flyway and to other wildlife and understanding the historical losses, Congress passed a really important federal law in 1992 called the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, or I'll refer to it as the CVPIA. Among other things, the CVPA had a bunch of fish protection provisions as well and was really a um, larger effort to, to mitigate for the impacts of California's water supply infrastructure. Um, with respect to wetlands, it had some really important provisions, including the dedication of water supplies to 19 specific wildlife refuges in the Central Valley and the creation of a restoration fund to financially support these wetlands and make sure they could receive their water deliveries. Um, it's important to note that these wetland wildlife refuges in the Central Valley are what we call managed wetlands. They've been cut off from the rivers that once overtopped their banks and fed them. And because those rivers were dams and levees were built, 
um, dammed and levees were built. And now they require water deliveries, much like irrigated agriculture. So part of what the, the CVPIA did was to guarantee senior water rights for these important um, wetland wildlife refuges. Unfortunately, um, the water promises of that federal law have not been fully implemented. Um, and one of the major threats to these Central Valley wetlands is the water supply shortages. So what you're looking at this graph at the very top of those red bars, that's the amount of water the refuges were supposed to receive every year pursuant to the CVPIA. The yellow is the amount of water that they actually received. So you can see that in every year since the law was passed, the refuges have not received the promised quantity of water. I think there are two reasons for that. One reason is a lack of infrastructure at some of these refuges, particularly some of the further flung wildlife refuges. The second reason is water supply unavailability or a lack of funding, and I think in part a lack of political will to acquire um, the adequate water supply for these refuges. You can also see that there's variation year to year. Um, so for example, in 2014 and 2015, those red bars are big, which means the water supply deficit is really big. And those are, as you know, drought years. Um, if we look at the, a bar from this year, you will see that that red bar is gonna be really big and, the, and these wetland wildlife refuges are gonna be very short in terms of their water supplies and it's gonna impact habitat for migratory birds and all of the other species that depend on these wildlife refuges. So thinking about challenges in the future, um, with climate change and the reality that we're going to be facing more frequent, more severe droughts, figuring out how to get more water supplies to these refuges, even in dry years, is really important. Um, the other threats that I thought I would note um, are particularly important outside of the wildlife refuges, where we still have many wetlands that are unprotected. Um, I think the two major threats outside of the water supply issues are development and incompatible agriculture. Um, on the left, you're looking at an image of housing developments in the Natomas Basin, which is an area near Sacramento, which um, used to have many, many wetlands. And you can see how um, the development, urban expansion um, is, is built out into the natural wetlands. And I think we continue to see wetlands converted to urban expansion. Um, another big problem for wetland losses is conversion of lands to forms of agriculture that are not compatible with wetlands. There are some forms of agriculture, um, pasture, rice particularly, that um, provide a lot of this, they, they either allow wetlands to maintain on the landscape or they provide some of the same functions as wetlands do. But unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of land being converted from these wildlife wetland friendly forms of agriculture to permanent crops, particularly nut crops, almonds, um, pistachios and others. Um, and vineyards. And once these, this land is converted to these higher value permanent crops, um, they lose those wetland values. So with all of those problems in mind, I'll spend the last little while talking about some of the things that Defenders is trying to do to protect our last wetlands and hopefully continue to grow the wetland footprint in the state. Um, the first thing is that particularly um, during and after the last drought, we saw legislative attacks on the water supplies and funding for the Central Valley Wildlife Refuges. And, you know, one would think that when Democrats hold both houses of Congress, that wouldn't be such a problem right now. But the politics of California water are complicated and fickle. And so we're always on guard for bills being circulated and introduced that would undermine um, the habitat values of these important refuges. We do a lot of outreach and education to members of Congress and their staff. We analyze bills. And we organize res responses within the conservation community when necessary. We also spend a lot of time focusing on securing additional water supplies for the wildlife refuges. Um, 
among other things, by supporting innovative new projects like the North Valley Regional Recycled Water Program, which is a particularly exciting one because it's using recycled water to provide habitat at the refuges. Another, another area where we're working to improve the water supplies for the wildlife refuges is through the state's expansion and efforts to invest in new water storage facilities. So in 2014, California voters passed a new water bond, which provided, I think it was $2.7 billion for new water storage infrastructure in the state. But those state funds came with a requirement that the state funds only be used for public benefits, and that half of those public benefits have to be ecosystem benefits. So Defenders has been doing a lot of work to try to make sure that some of those ecosystem benefits come in the form of water supplies for wildlife refuges. Um, one of the most exciting projects in that space is the Los Piqueros Reservoir Expansion Project. And this is an effort to expand an existing off-stream reservoir in Contra Costa County in the Bay Area. Um, which would increase some uh, urban water supply resilience, particularly in dry years to Bay Area cities, and is also proposing to provide a lot of water for some of the refuges that are south of the Delta in the San Joaquin Valley. So that's a project that we'll be watching really closely and trying to make sure that it is providing those concrete benefits. Another area where we work is to try to make sure that we maintain the existing funding for the refuges and secure additional funding. Um, unfortunately, in the last days of the Trump administration, there were some changes, um, changes in legal interpretations and in guidance documents that, that would, if implemented, severely undermine the restoration fund, which is that, that Central Valley Project Improvement Act um, provision that is so important for getting water to the wildlife refuges in the Central Valley. So we have been working to educate the Biden administration about those problematic changes and to try to get them to quickly change course. We also advocate for increases in state funding for the refuges. In 2014, we were again um, really successful in that water bond in getting substantial funds dedicated to the Central Valley refuges and we've seen some of the benefits of those efforts already. Um, there was a lot of investment in improving water conveyance infrastructure for the Gray Lodge um, refuge, which is a state wildlife area in the Sacramento Valley. And um, full implementation, implementation of that project will really help to expand the habitat out there for birds and giant garter snakes and other species. Um, you may have seen that last week, Governor Newsom in his proposed budget um, included $5.1 billion in funding for water supply infrastructure for drought related investments and other water related priorities. And defenders will be working with partners in the conservation community to try to make sure that some of those dollars are dedicated to protecting and enhancing our wetlands statewide. And then finally, um, we do a lot of work to halt destruction of wetlands statewide and to try to grow our wetland footprint. Um, with respect to, to halting wetland destruction, we've been very focused for, gosh, more than 15 years um, to try to advocate for adoption and implementation of new state wetland regulations that will help to protect all California wetlands no matter what happens at the federal level with the Clean Water Act and decisions about the jurisdictional reach of the Clean Water Act. As you may have heard over the last several administrations, there's been tremendous controversy over the waters of the US rule or the clean water rule, it has many different names. Um, but that's about which waterways and wetlands are entitled to protection under the Clean Water Act. But in California, we recognized early on that however that, that federal definition um, was constructed, many California wetlands would likely be excluded um, because they're completely isolated or for other reasons. And so the state water board set out um, to adopt its own wetland protection regulations. And we worked very closely with the water board in that process for more than a decade. In 2019, in a major victory, the Water Board adopted 
um, those state wetland regulations, which have been a really important backstop to the reductions in federal Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Um, after they were adopted for the last couple of years, we have participated um, in trying to help defend those regulations against court challenges and are trying to make sure that they're really meaningfully implemented to protect wetlands statewide. And then finally, we collaborate through the Central Valley Joint Venture, which is a collaboration of state and federal agencies and non-governmental organizations to try to grow the wetland footprint in Central Valley. Among other things, we work with agriculture to try to encourage wildlife friendly agricultural practices. Um, and we try to invest in the really high value beneficial wetland restoration projects that can help us to you know, get beyond that 5% of remaining wetlands. And that's a little insight into the work that we're doing um, on wetlands at Defenders of Wildlife. And I think we'd love to open it up to questions now. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start our question and answer period. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so that you all can see us a little bit better. Just one second. So we did receive quite a few questions um, and we will do our best to get through them as much as possible. Our first question we have here, Rachel, um, came up a little bit earlier in your presentation, and it is, how does Defenders work with the water grabbers in the Central Valley, like big agribusiness? So in, you know, in addition to work on wetlands, I also do um, a lot of work on trying to protect the Delta ecosystems and our native salmon runs, and in that space, um, we do a lot of work to try to help California to reallocate water supplies towards our rivers and towards the Bay Delta ecosystem, our wetlands and other wildlife. And so much of that effort um, is, is, you know, <laughs> a, a, an effort to reallocate some of that water from big agriculture in the Central Valley back towards the environment. Um, but with that, I would also say that some of the agriculture in the Central Valley is really important for wildlife. So, for example, um, rice fields in the Sacramento Valley provide surrogate wetland habitat. There used to be wetlands throughout the valley, but they were um, drained and converted to agriculture. And today, those rice fields provide important habitat for, for Pacific flyway birds, for giant garter snakes, and other species. And so we're really mindful of the balance of different water uses across the state um, and trying to make sure that we're maximizing the beneficial uses of water, both in the agricultural sector and for the environment. Thanks, Rachel. Um, the next one we have here, you touched on this a bit, um, but is there any money for wetlands in the governor's May revise? So in the Senate's budget, proposal. The Senate um, set forth a drought package a couple of weeks ago, and in there, there was money that was very clearly set forth. I think it was $100 million that was dedicated for um, wetlands in the Central Valley, and we were really pleased to see that. The governor's proposed budget didn't have as explicit of a carve-out um, for wetlands or for Central Valley wetlands, but there are some big buckets of funding in there for natural infrastructure and for restoration. And I hope that as the budget is worked out in the coming weeks, um, we can make sure that some of the funding in those buckets is dedicated to wetlands and particularly these important Central Valley wetlands. Thanks. And then this question was asked before you got to some of your work that you're doing with Defenders. Um, but the question is, any proposed policy solutions to saving our California wetlands? You know, I think one of the most important policy solutions has been the work at the Water Board to adopt these new statewide wetland regulations, which in addition to being a backstop to the Federal Clean Water Act and the reductions in federal jurisdiction to protect our wetlands, um, create uniformity across the state and make sure that all of the state regional, the regional water boards across the state are adequately protecting wetlands. And so I think making sure 
that that policy is effectively implemented going forward and that the regional boards have adequate permitting resources and staffing to properly implement those regulations are one of the most important things that we can do to protect wetlands statewide. Great. And then next question is, there is an initiative to make Shasta Dam taller. What do you think of this? Um, some considerations that this person has heard is that, you know, it will increase water, but has the potential to destroy Native American art. So Defenders has long been opposed to this proposal to raise Shasta Dam. Um, among other things, raising the dam would harm salmon runs that spawn beneath the dam, would flood the, say, the McLeod River upstream of the dam, which is a wild and scenic river and a really important trout fishery, um, and would harm some really important cultural sites of the Winnemum Wintu people. Um, for those reasons and others, we participated in a lawsuit to oppose the Shasta Dam Rays, have submitted comments on all of their environmental permitting document, and will continue to fight to oppose that really problematic project. We got a question here, um, which is, do you ever work with Sierra Club in land preservation? Yes, we work with Sierra Club a lot. Um, we don't work with Sierra Club on wetland issues particularly, um, but on efforts to protect the Bay Delta ecosystem, on opposing the Shasta Dam Rays, and on a lot of other um, projects. We work very closely with them and they're always great partners. Okay, next question here is, how will California's drought impact migratory birds this year? This is a really big concern as we're starting to think about water management and what's happening in the state. You know, when I think about migratory birds in California, the key parts of the landscape that I think about are the Klamath Basin, the Central Valley, and the Salton Sea in the south. Um, and I think all of these areas are being hit really hard by drought, particularly up in the Klamath Basin where things are really desire, dire but we're gonna see major reductions in habitat, major, major reductions in the Klamath Basin, pretty significant reductions in the Central Valley. And I'm not as familiar with what hap what's happening day to day at the Salton Sea, um, but there are big problems in the Salton Sea as well with respect to habitat availability. And so part of what we get really concerned about is that as habitat shrinks because of water supply unavailability because of drought, we see crowding of birds as they come through the valley. Um, and in prior drought years, what we see is disease outbreaks of avian botulism and avian cholera as the birds are crammed too close together in too little habitat. Um, and we see bird die-offs. And I think folks are really concerned about the possibility of that happening this year. Um, some of the things that we're doing with our partners to try to guard against that you know, first we're constantly advocating to make sure that the refuges get the water they need to maximize habitat. Um, we're also looking at some innovative technological um, tools that we can use. So one of our partner organizations, Part Blue, Point Blue Conservation Science has built what we call the water tracker, which is an opportunity to use satellite data to understand where there is and isn't water on the landscape in real time so that we can understand habitat availability and try to shift water deliveries to make sure we have enough habitat in the right places at the right time to support birds as they're migrating through the valley. Thank you. And I see some more questions coming in here. So I just wanted to let you know that I see them and, and we will get to as many as we can. Um, the next one I have here is what is happening with the federal waters of the US rule and what does it mean for California's wetlands? As you may know, um, in the last federal administration, there was a new um, interpretation of the jurisdictional reach of the Federal Clean Water Act that was released, new regulations. And it was a very narrow reading of the Federal Clean Water Act and what waterways the federal government has authority to protect under the Clean Water Act. Um, that, would have been a major problem for California and for a lot of our wetlands like vernal pools that would likely have fallen outside of that articulation of the scope of federal jurisdiction. But luckily, California had its regulations in place right around the same time as that new 
um, Trump era rule was implemented. And so even if these wetlands lost their federal protection, they would have really strong protections based on state law that remain in place no matter what happens with the federal protection. So we really saw the importance of that 15 year advocacy campaign and that progress at the state level because it provided this really important protection even when we lost those federal protections. In terms of what happens next at the federal rule, um, I think as I've been watching the news, it looks like the Biden administration is not planning to go back to the Obama administration rule exactly. So there will be a lot more regulatory process, I think, to withdraw this underprotected federal rule um, and to craft and implement a new federal rule that hopefully um, will help to better protect wetlands and other waters throughout the country. So we have a question here that I think Pam might be able to, to jump in on as well, which is um, about strong environmental lobbying in Sacramento. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. And um, it, it's somewhat related to the question about working with the Sierra Club. So um, as Rachel said, we work with the Sierra Club and we work in a variety of collaborative environments with many other environmental nonprofit organizations, as well as working um, very closely with state and federal government agencies. Um, here in Sacramento, uh, you know, the California Program of Defenders was founded in the year 2000 and um, our, our headquarters gave us some flexibility as to where we wanted to be um, to, uh, for our California head, headquarters to be based. And our former director chose Sacramento because obviously it's the capital and, um, you know, where a lot of the, the agencies are located, of course, the state legislature, and um, it's the place to be be to help make change in policy. And um, we work very closely with a wide variety of um, environmental nonprofit organizations, and there is a strong environmental lobby. Um, Defenders is also a very proud um, member of a group called Green California, which is a coalition of sorts um, of organizations that work on a wide variety of environmental issues, not just wildlife and conservation and habitat, but also, um, you know, recycling and um, climate change and just you name an environmental issue, it is represented in Green California. And we heard from representatives at the state legislature um, many, many years ago before Green California was founded that they heard different things from different environmental conservation organizations and they urged us to try and get on the same page and bring to them our collective priorities. And so that was um, essentially how Green California was created. And so um, we are regular participants in that. Monica is um, always joining both the, the full Green California calls and the variety of subcommittees um, on a wide variety of issues. And we all collectively come up with our priorities and take those to the legislature. We also um, are regularly on calls with state leadership. So um, environmental consultants for the various um, legislative committees, as well as the leadership of both the Assembly and the Senate. Um, the Green California Coordinator uh, hosts regular calls. We were just on two calls yesterday, one with Secretary of Natural Resources Wade Crowfoot and one with the uh, um, Speaker of the Assembly's um, consultant on environmental issues, Marie Liu. So we are um, definitely have our finger on the pulse of the state legislature and work very closely with our environmental partners. Thanks so much, Pam. And, you know, I wish we could get to everybody's questions. I'm going to end with um, one final one for Rachel, which is, do you have any recommended wetlands that you can visit? And what is the best time to visit the wildlife refuges in the Central Valley? So, you know, depending on where you are, there are wonderful um, wetland opportunities throughout the state. But I particularly love these Central Valley wildlife refuges, which, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area and I didn't even know they existed until I started working at Defenders. But if you're able to head out into the Central Valley to visit one of these refuges, the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge, Sutter, there are, we can give you a list of them if anybody is interested, but particularly heading out there in the winter months when the migratory birds are coming through, it's magical. And you can see just tens of thousands of birds 
filling these wetlands. And if you go at sunset, they all fly off into the sunset all at once to go forage in the rice fields at night. And it's really an amazing experience to be out there and watch these just tens of thousands of birds fly up into the air all at once. Um, so I really think these special, they're special places and they're worth a visit. Thanks so much, Rachel. I love to end on that one. Um, so quickly, everybody, I wanted to share first my email address. If you have questions that you didn't get answered, you're welcome to reach out and I will see how we can get them answered. I also wanted to share a link to our re recently published wetland story map. This is a place where you can go if you want to explore some of the topics Rachel covered today and also check out some of the maps that you saw featured in the presentation. And finally, I wanted to invite you, thank you again for coming, and also invite you to our next virtual event that we will be hosting. So in June, we're going to be hosting our California Wildlife Advocacy Week, and this is a great opportunity for you to sign up to be in meetings with our state representatives to talk to them about important wildlife issues. Um, you can see here a photo from one of our previous ones before COVID-19 um, and then what it will most likely look like this year. Um, so if you're interested in attending, you may have already received an invite for this event via email. Um, and if you haven't, I'm going to share a registration link in the chat so you can go um, and see if you're interested in being involved. So one more time, I want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. It was great to see you all here um, and I hope that we will see you next time. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for such an informative presentation. I'm seeing a lot of thanks and excellent presentation. I knew you all would like it. So thank you. And thank you for facilitating for us, Monica.